everyone. I would like to welcome you to the Technology Ireland ICT SkillNet webinar series named Lockdown Your Learnings. Uh, I hope you are all keeping well and adjusting to this new normal that we have found ourselves in. Uh, today, the aim of the lockdown, your learnings, is to uh, uh, present you the seminar AI and the Reverse Arc of Digitalization. Uh, please bear with me uh, if there will be any trouble. Uh, before we get started, I would just like to point out a few things. So the first one is that this session will be recorded and available for distribution afterwards. So uh, if you need to leave or your connection drops, you can pick up the webinar at a later stage. Second, participants are muted on entry to reduce any noise or interference. And three, there is a Q&A facility at the bottom of your screens where you can ask questions. And at the end of the presentation, I will try to answer as many as possible. My colleague Aideen is working in the background uh, to help me with this. Bear with me now as I share my screen and take you through my presentation on AI and the reverse arc of digitalization. So uh, let me first start by presenting you this model company. Uh, it has three employees. Uh, fortunately, this company also um, has some customers and they are making various interactions with the company. And of course, since they're in business, they also have some, some files, some data. So basically the whole process of digitalization is in taking this real world uh, company and its customers and trying to move it into a kind of virtual uh, digital world. One of the important things in digitalization is that there is a really very strong focus on having uh, things centralized, uh, standardized. So basically, we, we want to achieve that all our data is stored in the same place and it is easy to work with, as easy to po as possible. And um, in reality, most companies probably still have a bit of issues in this area. As part of this centralization, there's also a lot of focus on cloud technologies. And now, of course, it's time to, to ask ourselves, where does the, the uh, artificial intelligence or data science come in? And uh, it's only natural that it uh, comes in exactly where all the data is. But in order for companies to basically have any value from, from AI, uh, of course, they require data scientists. So usually, initially, uh, when the, the role of the data scientist was actually first appeared, uh, this was a, quite a challenging position. Uh, so there was a lot of talk about data scientists having to be kind of leading double lives and being a kind of a unicorn, someone who is able to very well communicate with the business people on one side and also handle all the infra infrastructure, which was definitely not very user-friendly, especially in the beginning. So basically, though these people moved kind of in between the two worlds, the real one and the digital one, probably they had to be, in order to be successful, maybe a bit more on the, on the, on the right side. This model of data science, or maybe I should just go back. So, um, it, it was, so the work of the data scientists was they did experiments uh, and basically they built models who made predictions and then more often than not, they had to uh, gather insights from that and communicate them to the, to the business people. So basically the work was really um, uh, definitely not end-to-end -end in terms of machines, but very much dependent on human interaction. And as far as data science and usage of AI goes, up to now, uh, some companies had a lot more success with it than others. So uh, obviously, very large businesses did well because they have the advantage of having the economy of scale. Uh, also, technology companies were very successful with that. Some of them, mainly because they already started initially with the idea that they will use all the data uh, for, for AI, so they didn't, they didn't need to repurpose it. Um, and then lots of various types of marketplaces, so e-commerce, also some 
classical retailers, and, and, and in the end, some financial institutions as well. Um, so, however, if we look at how, how big an impact data science made in some other areas, um, I mean, I think that many small businesses are a bit disappointed regarding what they got, got out of it compared to how much talk there is about it. Also in manufacturing, I mean, obviously things are changing now quite rapidly, but looking years back, manufacturing didn't have such an impact as the businesses mentioned about. Also construction, farming, so all the kind of businesses that are very much grounded in the in the real world. Obviously, the, the question that uh, I, I, I ask is, so how how will the the artificial intelligence uh, how will it make a bigger impact in the real world? How will it spread back from the confines of the digital uh, to to basically? Uh, provide value to as as wide a circle of businesses and people. The first thing that basically we have to look at is the computing power. I mean, we all know uh, it's been talked a lot how computing power enabled the whole deep learning revolution, but it's still interesting to look at the numbers uh, every now and then because in, in in fact is that this hasn't stopped. So. Um, the, the rise in computing power is, is, is continuing and is, it's steep. So if we look at the, the chart on the right, um, it shows basically what was the amount of compute that was used for the most complex models that were built. And for a long time, it basically it fo it followed Moore's law. But then at about 2012, it, it, it started really, really growing, uh, so uh, much faster than before. And we see that uh, since 2012, this metric has increased to 300,000 times. So obviously this is something to, to, to give us uh, thought. And also, I mean, in the chart before, we, we looked at the most complex models that were built. But what, what, what if we look at things that are more, uh, more in our reach? So if we if we consider the time it takes to train a neural network for image classification on ImageNet data set, it took 10 hours in only three years ago and 88 seconds uh, in, uh, in the last year. And something similar also happened to the cost. And the last uh, th gra graph in computing power is especially interesting because it shows that it's not that just we have more compute available uh, and it is cheaper than it used to be, but in fact, the efficiency of the algorithms is increasing as well, and it is also doing so exponentially. Um, so basically, if we look at it, uh, if we take a model from 2012 and just look at how much computation would it take um, today uh, uh, to basically accomplish the same task but uh, using newer algorithms, it requires 44 times less um, compute than it used to. So obviously, if we return now to, to that model company of ours, I've, I've added this uh, as a kind of representation of, uh, of compute. Another, of course, strong enabler for, for anything uh, relating to AI is is data. Uh, and if we look at it, we have a major problem in, in, in you know, classical uh, AI and deep learning with, with labeling. So although we have a lot of data, usually not that much of it is, is uh, labeled in the way that supervised machine learning models would make sense of it. So often this meant that we had to uh, basically employ small armies of data labelers, especially for more complex projects. But this is changing a bit now. And one of the ideas that is really helping, and it, uh, in, in, in essence, it is not really a that complex idea, is self-supervised learning. So in self-supervised learning, basically, you start with a huge amount of data, and then you take one, one data point, Let's say you take an image, 
and you, you remove part of the image. And then you try to train the model that guesses what did you remove based on uh, everything that was left, so the, the remaining part of the image. So, um, and in this way, actually, the model is, uh, can be trained to, to find a good representation of data. So it is able to, to learn something from it. And then after we have this model, we can just put it on a much smaller data set, which was labeled correctly, uh, and, uh, and achieve really great results. Yeah, here, here I have a statement by one of the more famous people in deep learning saying that uh, the next revolution that will happen in AI won't be achieved with supervised learning, but uh, with uh, unsupervised or some other, un other types of methods. So um, if we go back to this model company of ours, I've now added uh, this huge amount of data um, that has been basically, uh, that can be used for, for pre-training the model using, using self-supervision. So this is, this is also something that, that um, can, can provide a huge value. Uh, and now if we look at some other aspects, uh, some other drivers, uh, obviously, currently there is really uh, an extreme amount of, of um, investment in AI, both in, in from governments as well as uh, private companies. Um, and basically, what this leads to is that we have a, a really a enormous amount of high quality research. So I'm um, including this link for for everyone who maybe hasn't come across it before. Uh, it's a really a nice website that tries to track all the papers that um, have been published and also have a code available. So it's very useful for, for prototyping and such things. And also we have more and more tools, very high quality tools available that, that help uh, putting machine learning uh, models to production. Mm. And one additional factor is um, auto ML methods. So a lot of the classical data science work is uh, being automated, especially uh, work on, on tabular data. What this causes basically is that um, we have a much lower, lower barrier to entry for, for someone who, who wants to work in applied AI or data science in companies, because these tools have gotten so much uh, so advanced. And also what is happening is that uh, more people in, in companies are involved with this. It's not just uh, a very small group anymore. A lot of reskilling is happening. So people uh, learning uh, the skills they need to, to work with this. And also what this leads to now, um, and I think that this is a very strong driver for everything regarding um, basically seeing more real world applications of AI is that the focus has shifted. So it's not so much about insights anymore, but it's more about building machine learning products. Um, so basically systems where, in a way, customer is um, directly interacting with the uh, outputs of a machine learning model, uh, which is, of course, uh, interesting, but uh, also brings uh, potential problems in, in ethics, in um, control mechanisms over such models and, and so on. If we go to another very important, basically, factor enabler for, for the spread of artificial intelligence methods uh, in the real world, it's definitely uh, machine learning on, on edge devices. Because um, if I go one slide back, just for a moment, um, when we do this machine learning um, products, and if the customer interacts with this model through an API, so basically that they they put their data um, to the cloud whenever they want to use the product, this introduces uh, many problems. Of course, in the first place, there's the issue of privacy. Um, there's also cost because obviously running uh, using cloud resources for a wide number of users uh, is, is, uh, is costly. 
Um, also, the energy and the network efficiency is not well, uh, especially in applications such as, let's say, video analytics and that would require streaming video to the cloud. Also, latency and reliability can be an issue. Um, so it's quite fortunate that uh, on the technology side, we have reached a point where uh, really a kind of an edge computing revolution is, is currently happening. Um, so um, here I included three devices, kind of uh, meant especially for, for prototyping that were, I, I would say, the most popular edge devices last year if I don't count the mobile phones, because many of them uh, also now have specialized chips for, for AI. Um, and also, in order to see basically what to expect from this area, it's interesting to, to, to go to this link, where there are um, someone has really taken the time to list all the companies who have announced uh, basically products related to, to edge computing uh, uh, specialized for AI, uh, or maybe they already offer them. And currently, if I've counted correctly, it's 80, 81 different providers. So we will see probably quite a flood of, of different products. If we do machine learning on edge devices, we, we introduce something like that. So um, we basically give uh, our users small machine learning models that, that run on, on their own uh, specialized devices. Of course, now the, the question is, um, what, what happens with all the data? So obviously, if they are not sending all the data to the cloud, can they benefit from, what, from the interactions of the other users um, without in, in, intruding into on their privacy? This is a very important question. And there seems to be at least a partial solution. Um, and it's quite an interesting one. So I will take you um, quickly through it. Um, and it's called federated learning. So um, in the beginning, let's imagine that we have all these different devices, and this blue dot is a model. So we put a machine learning model that is the same for all the devices on the device and in the beginning. And then one of our users takes the device and start to use it. And so basically, as, as he's using the, the device, the model is also updating. So it is taking into account his, interact, his or her interactions. And the result is a new model that is a bit different than what was initially on the device. And this happens for all the different users on all the different devices. And what we get basically is a large amount of slightly different models. And then what, go, what gets sent to the cloud or some centralized place um, is not the data. It's just the model that was that was trained on the data. Uh, so what happens then is that all these different models are taken together, and they produce one new new version, basically of a universal model, which goes on the devices, and then the, the circle basically repeats itself. So um, in this way. Uh, we can have machine learning that takes into account data from different users without having them to share the data. So the question is that will, will the companies go for this? And yes, yes, as time goes by, probably they will because edge, edge computing really does have this nice um, economic uh, effect for them in that it um, basically, it, it it makes the, the users finance the hardware that the companies will then use to, to analyze their behavior. So um, obviously, uh, we, are, we are seeing, I think, some of them very carefully considering this aspect. So I'm quoting here um, a result by Facebook that they have developed um, a kind of system out of scale who basically decides when some cal calculation will be run on the device and when will it have to go to the cloud based on the capabilities of the device. So um, I, I mentioned here some, some use cases that, that seem like maybe encouraging. So um, one use case is the, the, the WeWalk smart cane. Uh, it's from, uh, I think, a Turkish startup. So the idea here is that basically you have a, a cane for uh, visually impaired people. Um, but you include sensors in it that can, can sense uh, the environment around the cane and, and provide useful information. 
so uh, probably this type of use case will be much more upgraded uh, as new hardware uh, arrives. Uh, and uh, it, it, it has been mentioned that likely very soon it will support 360 degree video analytics processing and, and could really um, could, could really provide uh, a lot of value. Uh, and another idea uh, that, I mean, another piece of news that was interesting to me was how they constructed basically a, a digital stethoscope uh, for, for uh, the price of $1. Uh, so they were motivated, of course, now in this time because of the, the virus situation and wanted to provide something that could help people who couldn't basically afford, afford a, uh, an expensive version. Um, and there, there are many kind of good, good uh, uh, use cases for, for edge computing, I mean, positive uh, and so. I mean, however, of course, there will also be other, other types of, of edge, edge computing devices. We all know that there will be. So, um, of course, there will be uh, cameras for surveillance. Uh, and, uh, of course, it will always be said that they are there for our health and, and safety, naturally. Um, and um, it is definitely something that introduces a whole specter of, of additional uh, ethical considerations. And we haven't really even dealt with the ones uh, related just to, to edge computing and uh, sharing of uh, users' data from their, their devices. So regarding um, video analytics, it's I'm interested in this technology, although it it also has me quite worried. I mean, I'm including some use cases here. So um, here is one um, that was done by Microsoft, uh, and it's uh, basically about action recognition. Uh, I mean, action action recognition is quite quite a hard problem. So uh, I was I was quite impressed when I saw this example. Of course, I mean it's an example from the lab, but still, um, obviously, uh, it's really something that's getting better and better with every month, I would say. Of course, now there is a lot of talk about uh, having to control um, if people have a fever or some other symptoms. And there's um, many, many, many companies and institutions are buying these thermal imaging cameras, um, although uh, they they maybe aren't really as dependable as it might seem uh, at first. It's it's quite difficult to to get an exact reading and uh, likely to have false positives um, or negatives. Uh, and here I've included a piece of news that that kind of stuck with me, uh, and it's in in Korea. There's uh, we are they're starting to see kind of uh, trainings that basically are aimed at employees, or I should say potential employees, uh, who have to deal with hiring bots. And these, these bots are, are using video analytics also to, to try to get a reading on people. And yeah, this, this, I, I think that, that this usage of video analytics in, is, in HR is, is, is quite, quite problematic. Uh, and out of this uh, example, the last one I've uh, I've saved for last for last is um, a kind of a a, um, a smart toilet. Um, basically, it uh, analyzes uh, excrement and supposedly is capable of um, detecting cancer from it. It has a whole bunch of cameras inside, uh, and it also it's important that it can identify um, the the user, and it does so with uh, fingerprint reading after you flush it. Uh, however, there is also another method, and um, I will not disclose it. I will uh, let you read it uh, if you're interested uh, yourselves. Um, I mean, with such devices, it's uh, it's always kind of a difficult decision. I mean, obviously, if, if, if this is something that can prevent cancer, who, who wouldn't want to have it, especially if it's not... Uh, extremely expensive but on the other hand of course it's uh, how how are we handling this data for example this this uh, example here isn't even an edge device um so it's actually it's sending everything to the cloud where it is analyzed 
but the problem was that the paper was sent uh, for publishing quite a quite a long time ago. So probably if they did the same paper uh, again this year, they would they would they would make an accommodation for edge devices. Yeah. So basically, the models that I was mentioning up until now um, are all forms of, of pattern pattern recognition. Um, most of most of AI still is today. Um, but then another direction that's quite interesting is, is uh, pattern generation. So, um, and this model that is presented here is especially significant, probably some of you uh, have heard about it, but still I will go quickly through it. Um, it's called the Generative Adversarial Network uh, or GAN. Um, and in the beginning, basically this learning happens that we have some training set. What the goal is, is to, to get the ability to generate uh, images for, that are kind of representative of this training set. Um, and what happens is that we start with totally random noise, and we have one network who basically, from this noise, tries to produce an image that would be um, as similar to those here. And basically, the second network tries to to find to 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 realize whether this image is from this set or whether it's fake and then basically those two networks uh, compete against each other and if everything goes well and it, you know it, it doesn't always converge it doesn't always go um in the end generator learns uh, how to generate images that look like they were from the training set it's, in, it's an interesting idea, a bit unusual, um, and uh, even more unusual are results that, that are achieved by it. Uh, so here is an example of uh, fake faces. Um, so uh, basically, uh, as I have, as you're looking at the video, it's, it, this is just a kind of a walk through the space of all possible faces, but none of them belong to, to real people. Um, and I mean, although the, the, the applications with faces are the most famous, uh, we, also, uh, we also have uh, many other examples. What is it possible to generate? Uh, so here I have found an example for, for floating. So, I mean, obviously, the question is always here, could it produce uh, results that would be truly novel? Uh, and, uh, I mean, not, not really. I mean, it, the, it, it, it wouldn't be able to produce something that is totally unexpected. Um, however, uh, it can find really interesting combinations, uh, basically, such that maybe haven't been uh, yet tried among existing uh, existing data set that it has seen. And uh, I mean, of course, these such cases are, are, are a novelty, but um, there's a lot of potential use cases, uh, especially in, 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 you know, industrial design and, and so on. Here I have, <laughs> I have shown an, an example of, uh, of a chair that was generated uh, um, from from one. So basically, they, they they built a model to to generate chairs, and then they selected one and actually made a chair out of it. It doesn't look really um, comfortable to sit in, but still, it's a, it's a nice example. Basically, here I've just you know, kind of I've shown you images that are generated from from. Uh, based on what the networks have learned about some training set. But more interesting are, are use cases that that do uh, that generate an, an image based on some condition. So here is obviously a use case that I think many companies will try to follow as, uh, as time goes on. It's a virtual try-on, so where you may have a reference image of a customer, a target clothes, and it is able to basically produce a, a likeness of a customer in that clothing. I don't think that anyone has done it so well yet that it would be really useful, but I have little doubt that it will, it will happen. And uh, here's another example. 
it's uh, this one is not made with guns, but uh, the good thing is that actually, if someone is interested, they can they can try a live demo, and uh, basically, it's uh, it's a, a way to to try makeup products, uh, and um, it's also a good example of of edge computing. So this is another reason why I included it because everything happens in the in the browser, and then it's also the possibility of taking an image and 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 changing it, making it different. Um, and I mean, obviously, there are some very, very obvious ways. I mean, you can take a, a person and make them look older or something like that. But this paper was especially interesting to me because they took an image and then they made it more memorable or more aesthetic, less aesthetic. So it's kind of um, intangible, intangible quality, uh, which was which was interesting. And uh, on the other hand, I'm a bit worried about potential usage of this in in, in advertising. Because it will, um, it could be used to to get ads that you cannot basically get them out of your head. Oh, I, I mean, I'm I'm exaggerating, but still. And of course, now we come to the topic that is uh, talked about uh, quite a lot: deep fakes. Um, but I won't I will, won't be going in the the usual direction with deep fakes, so don't don't worry. I I will show one example here. Um, it's a uh, quite a recent. Uh, uh, software, it's open source, uh, it's available here. So basically here is a person, um, um, the original person, and then he's able to, to make these deep fakes and it is it can be done uh, in real time. And I think that there is also an integration with Zoom. So uh, there were some examples of people, um, I think one person uh, took the likeness of Elon Musk and did, did a Zoom, Zoom bombing or, or how is it called? So it was talked about, um, and it. Felt, I mean, obviously, if one is very careful, they, they notice that these are fake images. But still, uh, it's not so uh, obvious. Maybe if you just took a glance. Um, and this, there, I've included some news here now. Um, it's uh, about having a virtual influencer. Um, so uh, basically, building a, a persona that's a deep fake, if you if you want to call it that, and and, and then uh, let it loose on, on social networks. Um, there's a company who's offering a marketplace where they would sell um, basically deep fakes for such purposes. You know, not not illegal or anything like that, but maybe for commercials or or, or things like that. And also, there's a Samsung, which of course is a kind of mainstream company who has uh, also recently presented the idea of um, Neon, uh, they call it. It's kind of a artificial human, artificial avatar. Um, so I think that this this is an interesting idea that is emerging. So obviously there is risks in in uh, using uh, deep fakes in, in politics and some other areas. But the the idea of creating uh, avatars maybe has some some positive uses uses. But let me now make a switch uh, to some other area, although I will get back to, to those avatars that I was mentioning. Um, and it's about what is happening in, in natural language processing. This was one area in AI in recent years that, that really exploded in terms of impressive results that were made. Um, here I'm showing you a graph of the number of parameters of the models that were used. Um, so I, I think that the current the current leader is still a, a Microsoft with set seven, 17 billion parameters. So a huge model which they've decided not to, to I think um, to share with the public because they are afraid that it might be misused. And also a very recent result that was too kind of interesting um, is um, chatbots because because of all that uh, progress in natural language processing, natural language generation. I think the chatbots are one area where um, basically they are so much different than they, they used to be a few years ago, where when there was quite some disappointment about with many companies in that area of AI at least. Um, so so the current best in at least in some statistics is uh, what uh, Blender that was made uh, at Facebook. Uh, here you have an, an example of a dialogue. Um, so obviously it's not a, a, a <laughs> it's not uh, what you would call really intelligent. It's still pattern recognition. However, um, 
it it is much easier to to have a kind of conversation with it as uh, with men before him um and uh, there's also this statistic that was interesting so after people saw the dialogues that members of the test group had with the with the with the bot 49% of them said that they would pre prefer talking to the bot than to the human based on the conversations that they observed and this is the highest result that was reached up to now so here you see the graph um so uh, it's not a kind of a turing test uh, but um interesting nevertheless i mean what i see as kind of a potential here is that by connecting this uh you know chatbots um digital avatars um technologies may meant to kind of give us some protection there might be actually uh in some time uh kind of an entity that would be basically a kind of a digital companion which would sometimes protect us maybe from some uh effects of the of the outside world that you know maybe we 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 wouldn't want maybe offer some protection against uh, unwanted surveillance uh, or something like that I, i think that in a way this digital companion would would really have enormous amount of data about us so it could watch over us in a positive way except of course if we don't uh, set the right controls on who is actually in charge of this digital companion i mean obviously there's a total difference if we were actually in charge so each individual by himself or whether this was some commercial entity but uh, here i have some examples of of kind of this supportive ai so for example there are now devices in shoes that um that uh, basically can tell you what is your uh, sports performance um you know there is a company that is offering kind of digital companions for for uh, elderly um i've looked into it it's uh, quite interesting because usually chatbots are i mean the digital assistants that we currently have today are more passive they are waiting for for the user to to initiate contact but this one are are more proactive um also i saw this paper where they make made kind of a um basically a model that takes what you have said and makes it more polite i think uh, it would also be quite useful for some for some people to have something like that available for when they need it um obviously some need it more more than others um and here is an example of video analytics so i think that this is one use case also for edge computing that will become very widespread so having the ability to to maybe do some sports and and get real feedback similar to what uh, one can get from coaches now um i think that that definitely a useful use case yeah i, I don't have much time left but still i wanted to talk about this subject it's uh, i feel it's really important especially if we are talking about this uh, real world ai so um so reinforcement learning it's a bit of a different way compared to to other uh, learnings that i've mentioned today uh, how the model learns so basically it's a model that is constantly in interaction with the environment so it's in certain state um it does some action and then basically the environment tells it what happened to it, to it and also whether there is maybe some reward for its action so it's kind of in this in this loop it's trying to complete a certain goal uh it's uh, basically looking to get uh, rewards from the environment the problem with reinforcement learning used to be or is still to some degree that it requires a very uh, large number of of tries to learn something especially in in cases where the rewards are are sparse so they're not happening like all the time but only when you you manage to complete some important action which happens rarely um so most of it was restricted into the virtual spaces so the best the most well known results came from it like uh, for for example the the, the model that that uh, won against humans in go uh, was an example of such a model but what is happening now in the, with reinforcement learning is that we are starting to see real world use cases and they they are interesting so not long ago um for example i saw a use case 
where uh, it was used to generate computer code. Um, because if you think about it, um, you know, the space of computer code is in a way also a kind of a virtual environment where you can have many tries to, 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 to check something. But the biggest value I feel for reinforcement learning is in robotics. So currently, most of uh, the robots that use these more advanced versions of reinforcement learning have to be trained in simulations. But the real value would be if, it, if they could learn in, in the real world, so without having to, to make transfers from simulated environments to real world. And I came across an interesting number of papers that are very recent. Um, and are very encouraging in terms of what is happening. Um, so for example, um, here on the right, we have a paper where they're trying to do unsupervised uh, reinforcement learning. So basically not giving the robots a special kind of uh, goals. So similar to how little, little children learn. So they basically they play, and they discover through that play some behaviors that maybe later on they can connect them in, in something that is uh, useful towards a certain goal after they got it. Also, what we have here, here in this paper, efficient adaptation for end-to-end -end vision based robotic manipulation, we have the idea of transfer learning applied uh, to reinforcement learning. So the idea is if you train very well in one environment, um, and then you put the same model into an uh, environment that is um, slightly different, that uh, it can then uh, fine tune itself to that environment. Uh, I mean, it won't be maybe as good as uh, it, it would be in the initial one, but still a huge improvements. And um, well, the last one is uh, basically learning through imitation. So a robot that learns by, by watching the human perform some actions and trying to to learn from that. Um, so I, I didn't have much time uh, left. Uh, so I did include, <laughs> to conclude this simulation co company, I, I did include one robot, um, especially because I think that um, it will be like this, that these robots will be kind of platforms simul similar to these tools here. And soon, in, in certain companies, they basically experiment with these platforms and give them new new meaning, like uh, if you take a video camera and put some software on it and it's a totally different sensor. And so I think this will also happen in robotics and it will be quite exciting. Um, and to conclude, um, I will quote uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber, also a very famous researcher, who, uh, who recently published an interesting blog. And I think that it's uh, kind of very much in line with what I was talking today. So although the real world is much more complex than virtual worlds and less forgiving, the coming wave of real-world AI or simply real AI will be much bigger than the previous AI wave because it will affect all of production and thus a much bigger part of the economy. Thank you for listening. This will be all uh, from this part of my talk. And of course, I would uh, now welcome any questions. So I have a question that uh, if this might transfer eventually, to human education, For example, the selected people take a time to get to get say get math problem steps. Yeah, I mean, I think what could happen uh, is that basically you would make maybe some sort of co-training so that the 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 robot would support the person who is who is struggling with dyslexia. Um, I, I definitely, I definitely see that, see that happening. Um, I mean, obviously, if programmed correctly, this uh, AI entities can can have uh, infinite patience, um, which which humans uh, lack. Um, so yeah, I I, th I think that that might be a, an interesting an interesting case for for that. Yes. Genetic algorithms. Uh, there's a question about genetic algorithms. Um, so it it depends. Uh, so there's a, a kind of a stream of research in in evolutionary algorithms as maybe a sort of an alternative to to some of the approaches made with neural networks. 
I think it, it's 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 potentially promising. I saw some use cases, especially in um, models that try to learn how to learn. I saw good results with uh, achieved with genetic algorithms. Um, yeah, so it's. Uh, I, I think that it's really good that we have we have multiple approaches here. So I mean, for quite a long time now, deep learning was almost kind of exclusively the focus of most of researchers. Um, we've reached a point now where there is uh, maybe at least in some part of the research community some doubts whether that is uh, kind of the the direction to go uh, forward. That there should be maybe some uh, some experimentation in different directions. So one one interesting dile dilemma is regarding uh, uh, neuro and sy symbolic approaches. So this is one where where there's quite a lot of discussion. So I have a question whether there's whether I have a, a kind of a summary of what types of data analytics and AI are best used for different applications. I mean I don't have one at hand. Um, it's it's good to to kind of um, to still kind of consider each case uh, each case on its own. I mean, um, there obviously are recipes, but still, um, it's. Uh, I mean, for some for some cases, I guess it's 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 quite obvious what should be should be used. But nevertheless, can AI help fight COVID nineteen? It's a, it's an interesting question. One thing that that I didn't mention today, um, but maybe I should in in regard to reinforcement learning, is that we saw some um, applications of reinforcement learning for scientific discovery. So uh, for for basically discovering potential um, uh, candidates for, for medicine. Uh, so potentially here, this would be one area. And then also, of course, all the things related to, to various kinds of surveillance. Um, in order to try to detect people who are sick, um, so here it's quite. Um, I, I, I found some research where uh, supposedly just by hearing you um, uh, cough, the system could uh, could with certain not really that bad an accuracy uh, uh, get the information that 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 you that you have the virus. So. Um, I, I, I think a lot will happen in this area, but maybe some of the things also won't be so good in terms of civil liberties. And um, also, I think that many of those algorithms, once they're out of the box, it's really hard to put them back in. Let me just uh, tell you about the upcoming webinars. So Horacio gonzalez Feles uh, will speak on the topic, where are all the clouds going? Uh, it will be on the 28th of May at 2 p.m. And John McGrath, Tech for Good. Uh, it will be on 4th of June at 2 p.m. as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for attending and your attention. Um, um, I, hope, uh, I hope it was worthwhile for you and that you have enjoyed it. So feel free to pass on the details to your colleagues and anyone who you might feel would be interested or would benefit from joining us for this webinar next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this webinar, please follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn to be kept up to date with all our news, events and programmes. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos like this one.